Hi everyone, my name is Elisa and I'm the VP of Growth here at Remote. Huge thanks to Nadia and Ariana for an amazing session earlier today. You have now seen winter in Amsterdam and summer in Johannesburg. So it is now my pleasure to welcome you here to Lisbon with Marcelo Lebre, our COO, whom you'll see later today. On behalf of Marcelo and myself, thank you for joining us during the celebration of spring in Portugal. And now let's move inside for our conversation with Adam Grant. Here we are. So now we are about to enjoy an incredible conversation with Adam Grant, a top organizational psychologist, author, and podcaster. Adam is one of the world's greatest experts on behavioral change and motivation. These are critical topics for all of us looking to find meaning in our work as we build happier, healthier lives. So without further ado, let's get started. So hello, Adam, and thank you for joining us at Remote Connect. The team at Remote has long admired your research and your quest for growth. In your most recent work, you advocate for the power of unlearning and rethinking as critical to unlocking new insights, opportunities, and better lives. Um, so my question for you is, what are some of the things that you had to unlearn and rethink over the last couple of years with the pandemic, a major geopolitical conflict, and the shift to more remote work? Uh, Elisa, honestly, I hardly know where to start. There, I feel like all of us right, have been rethinking probably more in the last couple of years than many of us did in the previous couple of decades. Um, I think probably the first thing I started rethinking when, when the pandemic began was my stance on remote work. Um, I, was, uh, I was extremely enthusiastic about it and still am. But I think I was missing some critical nuances around um, basically the question of, of who should be remote and when and how often. Um, I guess going back to the, the winter of 2018, I went to a bunch of, of CEOs and startup founders. And I said, look, we already have a meta-analysis, a study of studies showing that as long as people are in the office together half the week, if you let them work from anywhere the other half, they're more productive, more satisfied, more likely to stay, and there is no cost to relationships. And of course, all the leaders I pitched bought and they said, no, we can't do that. People are going to procrastinate. Our culture is going to fall apart. And they were afraid to open Pandora's box. And I thought they were making a huge mistake. And I think in many ways they were, right? If they had been willing to run even a remote Friday experiment, uh, we would have gone into 2020 a lot more prepared. What I didn't anticipate, though, is, um, is all the challenges that, that people who are in truly interdependent jobs would face when it comes to collaborating in real time and communicating. Um, and since you at Remote are, you know, are basically a go-to resource for distributed teams, but you already knew this long before I did, but I really had to rethink my push to say, look, anyone can work remote in any job um, and start thinking about much more, okay, um, if we think about interdependence, in my world of organizational psychology, we think about it in terms of sports, um, actually, which normally I hate doing at work, um, because I think sports metaphors have very little to do with how we actually work. Um, when was the last time in your job you, uh, you had a bunch of people agree on exactly how to keep score, and you also hired referees to enforce the rules? But this is a rare sports metaphor that actually works. Um, when we study interdependence, we find that there are three types, and they basically map on to individual sport, relay sport, and team sport. And what I was failing to recognize is that being fully remote works beautifully if you're playing an individual sport like gymnastics, right? We can let everyone go off and do their own floor routines, their own beam, their own vault, vault their own bars, and then the whole is going to be the sum of the parts. But when people are doing relay race work, you better make sure that the person who's passing the baton is in synchronous communication with the person who's about to receive it. And especially in true team sport work, like basketball or what I was raised to call soccer, but most of the world properly calls football, right? We need to be in the same room or the same Zoom so that we can, we can coordinate. If I'm going to pass you the ball and then it's going to come back to me and then it will go to someone else. And I, I think I really under, underestimated the complexity of, of being fully remote um, in, in a team sport or relay sport kind of job or culture. Um, and that was a big rethinking moment for me. That's great insights. And actually, I have a lot of questions around this shift and how we're all rethinking our role in, uh, in this new world of work. So these last couple of years have been especially challenging uh, for leaders leading distributed teams who had to unlearn and rethink many of the ways in which we create a culture and how we build trust. 
So what is your advice for leaders as they seek to create a culture that encourages unlearning and rethinking in this new world of work? Well, I think what we want to do as leaders is, is think a little bit less like preachers, prosecutors, and politicians, and a little bit more like scientists. So when you go into preacher mode, you're basically trying to proselytize your own views and spread them to other people. If you're in prosecutor mode, you're attacking somebody else's views and trying to prove them wrong and win your argument. If you're in politician mode, you only listen to people if they already agree with your views. And what I've found in my research is that all three of those mindsets can stop us from thinking again. Because whether you are, are thinking like a preacher, a prosecutor, or a politician, you have already concluded you are right, other people are wrong. So they might need to think again, but your cognitive work is already done. I should say, Elisa, somebody asked me recently, is there anything worse than thinking like a preacher, prosecutor, or politician at work? And the only thing I could come up with was cult leader. <laughs> Although my wife tells me she actually is always right, so I don't know what to do with that. But um, in all seriousness, my favorite alternative to preaching, prosecuting, and politicking is to think more like a scientist. When I say think like a scientist, I do not mean that you need to own a microscope or buy a telescope. Although personally, I would enjoy it if every workplace had a, a dress up like Bill Nye um, day on, you know, at least a, a couple times a year. For me, scientific thinking means that you don't let your ideas become your identity. That you're as motivated to look for reasons why you might be wrong as you are to search for reasons why you must be right. I, I think a good scientist right, has the humility to, to know what they don't know and the curiosity to seek out new knowledge. And that means you, you end up listening to the ideas that make you think hard, not just the opinions that make you feel good. You surround yourself with people who challenge your thought process, not just the ones who agree with your conclusions. And so as a leader, if you want to get into scientist mode, what the data say is that you should recognize so many of your, your opinions that you hold are just hypotheses waiting to be tested. Every new vision, new strategy you roll out, we roll out each decision you make, that is an experiment without a control group, right? It's an A, B test, only you, you ran the A and you forgot there could have been a B, C, and D. And if you adopt more of that scientific mindset, you end up iterating more, um, you test out more ideas, you learn faster, um, and you can quickly discover when you were wrong. And the faster you are to recognize you're wrong, the faster you can move toward getting it right, which last time I checked is the goal. Sounds amazing. And I'm going to shift it a little bit on the, uh, the top, to the topic of culture. Uh, businesses develop mission statements and core values to hold cultures together. But how can we ensure that these missions and values genuinely mean something as real living guides, especially with the added challenge of managing distributed teams? Yeah, I think managing culture has probably been the hardest part of, of moving into a remote world because we don't get to, to see the values come to life in the same way. Um, I think the, probably the most underutilized resource in most organizations for culture is a group of people that I think of as culture carriers. So your culture carriers are the people who go above and beyond to live your mission and breathe your values. Um, they're the people that everyone else looks up to as, you know, as really representing who we are, what's distinctive, what's central, and what's enduring about our, our organization. And what I found when studying this is, first of all, most senior leaders have no clue who the culture carriers are in their organizations, right? Because you weren't in the room or in the Zoom when those critical behaviors were happening. So what I like to do when I come into a new organization is to say, if I can only talk to one person at your company, and after just 10 minutes of, of interacting with them or even just observing them, I would start to appreciate what's special about your culture. Who is that person? And if I ask a dozen people that question, I start to hear the same names over and over again. Mm -hmm. And those are the culture carriers. And then what I want to do with those people is first I want to protect them because oftentimes they are doing a second job, unrecognized and unrewarded. Um, it's a huge amount of work, right, to take people aside and say, you know, actually, that is not who we are. Yeah. Um, it takes a lot of effort, right, to go above and beyond to to make sure that you are not only operating by a company's core values, but that other people can see you exemplifying them. And so the, if you're not careful, your culture carriers are gonna burn out. But I also wanna make sure that those culture carriers are empowered in critical moments where culture is shaped. I want them leading recruiting efforts. I want them actively involved in onboarding new people. I want them to lead team meetings and to speak at all hands so that we can all soak up those moments where they're they are actually embodying the culture. 
And I think that one of the best examples I've seen of this recently was, was at Pixar. Hmm. So when the pandemic started, uh, all of a sudden you have all these animators and engineers and designers at, at Pixar who can no longer work in the building that Steve Jobs personally designed for creative collisions. Like, how are we going to do this? Where is our culture going to go when, when nobody is in the same room? And they ended up starting a project where every single person at Pixar was asked to tell a story about a time when their culture was at its best. And then in those stories, they found that there were certain characters that showed up consistently. Those were the culture carriers. And then they essentially reorganized, they re-engineered their values around what are those stories representing about who we are and who we want to be. And I can't think of a better way to, to not only find your culture carriers, but to celebrate them too, than, than to say, let's, let's actually find the stories that, that, that capture the very best about our culture, who we aspire to be, and then let's rewrite our values and our mission around those stories. Wow, this is so insightful. And this resonates very deeply, I think, with all of us here at Remote. You may have heard that at Remote, um, one of our core values, actually it's our number one value, is kindness. Um, and we care so deeply uh, about infusing kindness into every single aspect of how we think and how we interact with each other. Um, and you cite kindness as a critical characteristic of the best leaders and, and, and workers out there. Um, so my question is, how can businesses operationalize kindness? Is that even possible? I hope so. Otherwise, what have I been doing with the last two decades of my career? <laughs> I think, yeah, I think there, there's good news from an evidence standpoint, which is it is possible to build a culture of kindness. And you know this, of course, from your experience at Remote. But in the data, what we see is that um, a lot of people confuse kindness with politeness. Um, and they are not the same. Right? Politeness is about making people feel good today. Kindness is about doing what's best for them tomorrow. And so part of a culture of kindness is, look, we're not just going to be nice to each other all the time. We're actually going to help each other. And sometimes that means instead of cheerleading, right, we, we operate like a, a great coach who dishes out tough love. And we're going to give you the critical feedback that you may not want to hear, but you desperately need to hear because we know that's how we invest in your development and ultimately in your success. Um, we can talk more about how to do that. But I think if, if you get that misconception off the table, Right? That, that kindness actually doesn't mean pulling punches. Um, it doesn't mean you know, hiding the truth or not being honest with people. People have a much easier time wrapping their minds around it to say, oh, you just mean we're going to care about each other, right? and we're going to try to support each other and help each other. Um, when, when we study that, there are a few ways that I think we can, we can build those cultures. First thing is that in my, my spectrum of, of values and interaction styles, from givers on one extreme to takers on the other extreme, Uh, you want to weed out the most selfish takers from your organization mm. uh, because the negative impact they have on your culture is typically double to triple the positive impact that a giver has. Um, and you can say, well, one, one bad apple can spoil the barrel, but one good egg just does not make a dozen. I still do not know what that means. I hope you do. Um, but bad is stronger than good. And so you have to be really careful to weed out the behavior of people who are systematically unkind, uh, who, you know, who perpetrate incivil incivility or even abuse. Uh, toward the people around them. Um, that's toxic, right? And then once you've screened out that kind of behavior on the extreme, what you then want to do is you want to encourage people to do what the entrepreneur Adam Rifkin calls five-minute favors, to say helping other people does not require you to be Mother Teresa or Gandhi, right? You can, you can micro-loan your time, your skills, your connections to other people. Um, and that means that you can add a lot of value to others in ways that only impose a little cost on you, or maybe even benefit you in some cases, right? So you want people to be thoughtful about helping in, in ways that are not self-sacrificing, um, but still end up being, you know, being beneficial to others. On this topic, so it's all too easy to fool ourselves into thinking that we're practicing kindness when we're really just avoiding a tough conversation um, that involves things like, you know, delegation or questioning or even potential conflict. So how do you know when it's time to speak up and confront and, and how do you do it kindly? I think it's always time to speak up, right? I think a culture of silence is a culture in which people never figure out what the problems are and therefore they never solve. Um, I think if, if you're constantly biting your tongue, 
Uh, if you feel like you don't have a voice, right? That's, that's a problem when it comes to psychological safety, which as Amy Edmondson would define in her research, um, psychological safety is the sense that you can take a risk and be candid without being punished, right? That you can speak up without fear of reprisal. We have extensive evidence that when you have that kind of psychological safety at work, um, good things happen. We know, for example, in hospitals, when people lack psychological safety, uh, they hide their errors and then everyone is more likely to repeat them. Whereas when they have psychological safety, they can admit their mistakes, to study what caused those errors, and then rethink their routines to try to prevent them. We know in tech companies that when people have psychological safety, they let their ideas fly. When they lack it, they bite their tongues. So I think what we want to do is we want to give people the psychological safety to speak up. Um, how do you do that um, is, I think, surprising to a lot of leaders. I found in some recent research with Konstantinos Kudaferis that it is not enough to just ask for feedback to say, listen, if you have a concern or an idea, please bring it to me because your team doesn't know how you're going to take it. Mm. Right? You might still bite their head off, even though you claim that you're open to it. What we found works much better is if you actually demonstrate that openness by criticizing yourself out loud and talking about some of the things you're bad at, some of the, the weaknesses that you're working on, some of the development goals you have, or even just some of the feedback you've received recently that you're, you're acting on right now. Um, some examples that I've seen of this that I thought were really good. Um, Brad Smith is the CEO, had a sign on his door. It was his 360 review from his board. It was on the outside of his door, not the inside. So that if you walked in for a meeting with Brad, before you even got into his office, you could see all the things that he was supposed to be getting better at. And that was his way of showing me, I have lots of room for growth. Um, I did a project at the Gates Foundation a few years ago where uh, I, I asked if the, the senior leaders were willing to criticize themselves out loud as a way of showing that, that humility and that openness. And to her credit, Melinda Gates volunteered to go first. And her team printed out 20 years of, of criticism on her on little note cards. She read them out loud in front of the organization. And one of them said, uh, Melinda is like Mary effing Poppins, practically perfect in every way. And she then started listing all of her imperfections. And it turned out that afterward, people were much more willing to raise not only criticisms, but also compliments up the hierarchy. My power distance started to melt away when they saw she's human, right? She's a work in progress, just like we all are. And so I think as a leader, modeling that vulnerability is extremely powerful for opening the door, right? Because you're not just saying, I'm open to feedback. You are actually proving that you can handle the truth. Now, to the other side of your question is, I think the, the, the challenge for a lot of us is how do we give that feedback, right? So I've decided I have an important issue. Um, it's either relevant to our mission or it's central to our values, and I need to make sure it gets heard, but I'm hesitant. What I want to do is I want to approach the, the person who's, who's my audience and say, listen, um, I, I actually was a little bit concerned about bringing this to you because I don't want to damage our relationship. Um, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be, I don't, I don't want anyone to shoot the messenger here. Um, I'm raising this because I really care about the organization uh, or I care about this particular issue and I know it matters deeply to you. And so I wanted to make sure it was on your radar, right? What you're doing then is you're clarifying your motives. Um, you're highlighting that I'm not here to judge. I'm not here to attack. I'm actually bringing this to try to help and support. Um, and that changes the, the way that a lot of people receive that feedback, right? All of a sudden they say, oh, like this, this person is not out to get me. They're actually out to, to try to improve things. Um, and I think that, that that's, that's one of the, the fundamental principles that we find when we study how people take feedback is so often it's not about the message. It's about the reason behind the message. And if, if people are confident that you believe in their potential, you care about their success, it becomes surprisingly easy to hear a hard truth. I'm so glad we got into this topic because there were so many gems in what you just said right now. It was so, so helpful. And I think that is also a great segue to the topic of health and well-being. You know, these are things that more and more businesses are investing into and encouraging. And it's easy to say that you care about your employees' well-being uh, when so many organizations operate in an environment where there's no established mechanism for measuring and improving it. So... How do you think businesses can be more effective at truly helping their team um, take good care of themselves? Well, I think this is another place where, where leaders need to step up and be role models. One of the best examples I came across recently was a manager who said, it's okay to call in sick. 
it's also okay to call in sad. And what I thought was ingenious about that was not the idea that now we're going to give you five sad days a year. If you don't use them up by December, we're going to take them away from you, right? <laughs> it was the idea that, that mental health is health, right? And just like if you broke your leg or if you got long COVID, we would expect you to take care of yourself. If you're feeling depressed, anxious, if you're burned out, if even just you're languishing and feeling that, that blah or meh, that I've, I've been writing and speaking about a lot over the past year, um, that, that that's actually something that we want you to prioritize, right? That we don't expect you to do quality work if you don't have quality of life. And I think that managers sending that message matters. I think matters, managers showing that they believe that message matters even more, right? So when it comes to walking the talk, um, a manager who actually announces to a team, I'm taking recharge or I'm gonna take some, some self-care time, right? Normalizes that behavior and says, this is not only destigmatized, it's actually encouraged. And I think that's, that's the beginning of providing people the kind of support they need to prioritize their own health and well-being above their productivity, which ironically is a better way to be productive. That's great. And I'm so glad that you touched upon the topic of languishing because that's something that we all experienced over the last two years. So it's, it resonates with many. Um, I think that with all of the hard topics that we touched upon today, I think it's right to end on a more positive note. And so I want to ask you, uh, how can we make work more fun uh, for ourselves and for everyone in our team? Or should we be thinking less about making work more fun and more about shifting work-life balance? Can I say both? <laughs> of course. I would, I would love to have both. So let's, let's start with making work more fun. Um, I think that, that too many people, when they hear the idea of fun at work, think, oh, all right, we need a, we need a ping pong table or a foosball table, mm -hmm. uh, or we're going to have to throw a bunch of parties at the office. Not everyone wants to party with their coworkers. Some people are very interested in being task focused and efficient. And I don't think that actually means that they're not willing to have fun at work, right? We just need to make a distinction that, that Dan Coyle described eloquently as the difference between deep fun and shallow fun. And so shallow fun is, is the frivolous, yeah, let's, you know, let's have that ping pong game um, or let's go out for drinks together. Deep fun is that, that sense of both joy and purpose that you feel when you're working on a hard problem that you care a lot about with a bunch of people that you respect. And I think that, that if you want to enable that kind of deep fun, one of the most important things you can do is you can give people the freedom um, and the flexibility to work on the things that they think are important, right? So whether that's, you know, taking a page out of the WL Gore playbook and saying, we're going to give you dabble time where you can work on anything you want as long as you can make a case that it's, it might advance our mission. Um, whether you reward people for high performance with more autonomy and say, look, uh, you know, as a way of thanking you uh, for this excellent work you did, we're going to let you craft your job. Um, and actually redesign how you, you, know, you do your work to, to try to, to not only add more value, but also bring your strengths to the table and create more of a personal highlight reel of work, right? Those are, those are ways that I think you can enable people to have more deep fun. But I also agree with your, your second premise. I think that, look, I study work for a living. I do not believe that work should be the most important thing in our lives. And I think that, that too many organizations have, have taken too long to recognize uh, that people can still do extraordinary work um, if it's not their, their single highest priority. And that again means, you know, we probably need some boundaries. Um, I think if you want to give people the freedom to have fun outside of work, uh, you need to let them know there are times when it's okay to not be working. Uh, that may be for some organizations setting up a Z-mail policy uh, where you say, look, you're not expected to check your email uh, or your, your texts on nights and weekends. If there is a true emergency, pick up the phone and call somebody. Uh, and that's a way of untethering people from their devices. Um, it may be for some people taking your entire team and committing to certain nights off where you know if the whole team is not working, you are not going to get sucked back in uh, no matter what's going on. Um, and I think, again, any steps we can take to make sure that, that work doesn't, doesn't take over life um, probably make it a little bit easier to have fun um, as, as part of our, our, our daily experience. Well, Adam, this was a very enlightening conversation and there were so many incredible gems for all of the leaders listening to us today. Thank you for joining us at Remote Connect 2022. It was delightful to have you. 
Honored to be here. Thanks for having me, Elisa.